Welcome to JAT Chat, presented by the Journal of Athletic Training, the official journal of the National Athletic Trainers Association. I'm Dr. Shelby Baez, an assistant professor in the Department of Kinesiology at Michigan State University, and I'll be temporarily taking over hosting duties from Dr. Kara Radzak on JAT Chat for the next few episodes. Today, I have the pleasure of being joined by Dr. Eric Sports and Mr. Merrill Hodge. They are authors on a new National Athletic Trainers Association mm -hmm. position statement entitled, Reducing Intentional Head-First Contact Behavior in American Football Players. This will be featured in an upcoming issue in the Journal of Athletic Training. Dr. Swartz is a professor and chair of the Department of Physical Therapy and Kinesiology at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. His research interests focus on the prevention and acute care of head and neck injuries in football, and he has served on the NFL Head, Neck, and Spine Committee Subcommittee on Safety Equipment and Rules. Mr. Hodge is an inspirational speaker and former NFL running back. He has spent time working at ESPN as an analyst and acted as head coach of the Your Call Football League. Eric and Merrill, thank you so much for joining me today. Of course, thank you, Shelby. Yeah, so let's get going. So what prompted the development of this position statement? Can you just discuss what is the big problem for our, our listeners? Sure. Um, so, you know, NATA position statements are, um, you know, they're, they're reviewed and, and updated if, you know, if appropriate, if deemed uh, important, uh, and like an eight to 10 year cycle. Um, so there was a, a position statement in 2004, it was a head, con head down contact in, in spearing and tackle football. Uh, John Heck was the lead author of that. Uh, Dr. Joe Torg was, was a co-author of that original uh, position statement in 2004. Um, and so it was, you know, in that time frame of uh, being revisited for an update. Um, in that uh, time span, um, John Heck and, and again, kind of expanding on, on the earlier research that Dr. Torg did in the 70s, the late 60s and 70s, with respect to cervical spine injuries in football and the identification of the behavior of head down tackling and, and spear tackling. Um, went a long way to, to really help uh, reduce that, that behavior in the sport and reduce uh, spine injuries in the sport from head down contact. Um, in the early then 2000s and, and the, you know, the past decade or two, um, it's become you know, a little more clear that that head first contact, not necessarily just head down contact, but head first contact, you know, still remains a risk for spine injury, but also is a common mechanism and risk for concussions and head injury. So uh, the, the scope of this position statement um, is just expanded from that original uh, position statement from 2004. So the objective in 2004 was to present recommendations that decrease the risk of cervical spine, spine fractures and dislocations in football players, whereas our, our objective is to provide evidence-based recommendations for reducing the prevalence of head-first contact behavior in football with the aim of reducing the risk of head and neck injuries. So that gives you a little bit of, a, uh, of an idea of the, the, the impetus and, and the, um, the significance of this updated position statement. Yeah, so it sounds like we, we made some significant strides previously, but the work has to continue in this position statement. It's just another layer to, to leading to that behavior change to reduce that exactly. uh, contact. Yeah. So, I, Meryl, I think it is so awesome and unique to, to see you on this position statement. Uh, can you just discuss what drove you to be part of this process and why was this an important p uh, position statement to be on for you? Um, well, Shelby, you know, I'm passionate, first of all, about just all of the uh, all the lines of communication and how things can be lost in translation and the importance of, of, of a team. I call it the gatekeeping system. When you think of um, when you're trying to change the course of something or improve an area. So in this case, trying to improve um, the, the care for head trauma and identifying it. And when you look at, you know, it's already been said, this has to continue to happen. Things evolve. You know, I was the first group of players in sports history and NFL history to do a baseline cognitive test before the season in 1990 and 91. For the first time ever in sports that was ever done by Joe Maroon and Dr. Lovell. Okay, well, where are we today? How things have evolved from cognitive recall to balance 
stability, those being the two most pivotal aspects of evaluation, evaluating severity. It's not losing consciousness. A lot of people get that confused, which is another reason there's so much confusion on what to do. So um, listen, I've been every, I've, I've, I've done something in every aspect from a player to a parent, to a coach. I've coached from seven kids, seven years old to 37 years old. Um, uh, the athletic trainer in every area I've ever been has ends up being my best friend because I'm in the I'm in the athletic training room all the time. That doesn't mean I didn't I didn't <laughs> practice or I was always hurt. But listen, this is how I was. If I do get hurt, I'm in there figuring out how do I get better, what process do I need to go so that I can take care of my body so I can play on Sunday. So um, I was always in there, and they end up being you know my best friends. They have a, a they got a they got a massive load um, of responsibility. Um, just in this subject, along with all the other things that they have to deal with. Um, the coaching um, in this needs to have responsibility and be educated. So they do the right. The players themselves, the athletes themselves need to understand it. Because if you think about head trauma, the thing that is most important, it's the same with mental health, is identifying it. The sooner you identify something, and if you don't identify it, well, then the rest is irrelevant. The proper steps of removal, irrelevant proper steps to care and evaluation and return irrelevant so identifying it becomes a critical aspect of it and those steps are vital so the, the athlete themselves need to understand that uh, coaches need to understand that officiating needs to understand that and that helps the athletic um, training aspect of it and then they have a responsibility you know once they get put in their hands then how do we help best give them tools to care for the athlete evaluate the athlete get the right care for the athlete before they return back to the environment. Um, and having that process, that steps and experience in it, you know, my career, most people in the media will say, oh, you, your career ended because of concussion. No, no, it did not. It did not end because of concussion. If that would have happened, I never would have played after the Monday night game when I had my first severe head drop. Would never. I actually, what happened was improper care of that concussion and the return to play so quickly and being returned to play over the phone by answering one question. And that's in 1994, even though in 1994, that's like archaic that that, that happened, but it's also led leads to my passion being involved in this. So that we don't make mistakes like this. People are up to speed on the most advanced tools, techniques, how you teach the game, how the game is practiced, how it is played. All of those things are a vital component of just creating a better, safer environment. Um, in all aspects of sports, you know, especially football. So um, that's really why I, I want to be a part of it so that we help do the very best to be the standard, you know, so far as what has been written on this. Does it mean it will always be the standard? No, we'll constantly have to be evolved. And I, that's what I applaud Eric for doing in the, you know, the group is they really thought like that and will continue to think like that. So it's a, a very proactive uh, paper for people and, and helping them move forward. Yeah, and Shelby, the um, you know, involving Merrill, and one of the things that he that he said was talking about the environment, you know, the environment around head safety, you know, and concussions and, and spine injury, and that athletic trainers are just a part of a of a team, a multidisciplinary team, and coaches have such an integral role, obviously, in teaching the players and, and helping to you know prevent injury and reduce the you know the head first contact behavior. Um, and so Merrill's, Merrill's involvement in, in the position statement and his involvement over the, over the years with, with entities like USA football and, um, and, you know, in athletic, athletic training, you know, as an athlete, uh, himself, uh, was, was really helpful for us as an authorship team. Um, uh, almost, almost as, a, um, like a, like a filter, like a, like a, a, a stop check for us, the things that we were coming up with, Merrill was incredibly valuable in helping us understand, you know, sort of the, uh, the reality and feasibility of some of the, um, you know, the conclusions uh, that we were drawing and the recommendations that, that we were considering. So one of the things that I'm, I'm gathering just from uh, what you were just mentioning, Eric, and, and Merrill, what you mentioned pre, uh, previously, are like, multiple people have to be in part of this process in order for us to continue to involve and, and see this behavior change. 
Uh, and I keep thinking about the term like stakeholders. We have multiple stakeholders in order for us in order to, to move uh, this, this field forward. So one of the things that was highlighted in the article was this uh, and, and stated that the responsibility for implementing these recommendations shouldn't just fall solely on an athletic trainer. And you all recommended this multidisciplinary team to implement these best practices to improve safety. Can you all just, just further elaborate and discuss on like what, what other stakeholders, who all do we need to have involved? And then what process would you all suggest uh, to get buy-in um, for um, from other stakeholders for future collaborative work such as this? Merrill, what do you think? You wanna take a shot at that first? Yeah, well, listen, I. I can think of stakeholders in a bunch of different levels. I, I, when I mentioned I, I've coached kids from seven to 37, um, let's start with the younger group. Because at the end of the day, a majority of our athletes are eight to 18. Okay? Nobody can argue that. I mean, in every sport, it's eight to 18. Um, when you think some of the, the stakeholders, you know, it's really parents. You know, when you think of parents, you know, um, and majority, and this fits with the majority of other stakeholders from, you know, equipment, providers. Um, if you just think of your overall health in our country, obesity is, uh, we're, the 11th, we're the 11th most obese country in the world. Okay. Now, 11 doesn't really re resonate with you unless you know there's 195 countries. We're 11. In two, 2030, we're going to be number one. Now, that right there is why I say stakeholders, when you think of parents, you think about all kinds of medical aspects of of health are a critical component of, of stakeholders and that we have activities for our kids. One thing about sports that it really does, um, especially what we've all been through, um, and this especially applies to kids, is the resiliency that can be evolved and developed in sports. Um, you develop accountability, relationships, confidence. Um, I've seen kids who come from really tough environments and how they can find hope in sports, they find self-esteem. So that aspect of it is critical that parents understand they don't live in fear of head trauma. We understand head trauma. I get, I used to get asked all the time, my son started playing at age seven and they're like, oh, aren't you scared he's gonna get a concussion? I'm like, no, I'm really not. First of all, actually I was the first coach in youth sports history I ever have a protocol applied to their program in 2003 and that exact same program I gave to USA football that becomes heads up football. But what I, what I'm getting at is oftentimes people live in fear of something because of their, their the information that they have gathered. They don't have the correct information. So they live in fear. So I go back to um, my son and when people would ask me about, do you worry about that? No. And here's why I didn't just say, no, um, I'd say, here's why. First of all, I know the process. I know the removal process. I also know about the evaluation process. And I know now where to get him where there is care, which we have now, which we didn't have that, you know, roughly 10, 15 years ago. You know, care was just kind of giving you time. You know, there wasn't the repair process that we have now from a cognitive ability to a physical um, rehab situation where once that's done properly, the, the, the athlete, the person can move back into that environment in a much safer manner. And I use the term environment because I know we're talking about sports, but trying to get parents to understand why you don't want to live in fear of it, the leading cause of head trauma in the entire country, tripping and falling. The most dangerous environment where that's probably gonna happen, the home. So walking into the shower, the backyard, the stairs, the steps, okay, that's a greater danger than actually if they're gonna go play some type of a contact sport. So wouldn't it be better to understand a what if someone has head trauma, the process and removal, evaluation, the treatment that is avail available, and the repair process that does take place and will take place if done properly. Um, I use this um, analogy a lot because I can understand how people live in fear out of ignorance. I built a home in Arizona. Um, we just moved in and I remember it was summertime and the first thing on the news, everything in the news was about all the drownings of kids and pools. It then went through all of these lists, you know, put these things in your water sensors, doors, um, get swimming lessons and CPR. Okay. Well, I did all of these, but I was like, I didn't know CPR at night. I could not sleep. I was like, 
because I was in fear of something I didn't know and I wouldn't be able to execute it if needed. So uh, when I want to take my kids to swimming lessons. I asked the swim instructor about that and they go, we do that actually here while your kids are swimming if you want to take. It. So I do. I learned how to do CPR. Now, does that mean there's not going to be an accident? No, but I am better equipped. I'm not living in fear anymore for if something does happen, I can execute. I have a better chance, you know, of creating a better, safer environment from that aspect. So I translate it to parents that don't maybe understand things, the better we can do. And I think this, this helps because you can help parents understand, you know, a head trauma. You know, when you think of the incident rates too, in every level I played, it's the lowest incident rate. You know, now because it's the brain, it, you know, it's a priority. It's not minimizing it, but those are facts. I mean, bumps and bruises are going to lead the way, especially when you're talking about youth sports. But when we have head trauma, if we don't take the steps that we've applied, which is another aspect I think is very important, you can have all of these steps. And if you don't take action, what good are they? So that's another part and an emphasis and a priority that all of us take the action when this does happen. So, you know, I think about stakeholders. That's that's where I start. You know, I mean, it, it permeates outside of that arena. But if we don't affect that stakeholder first, sports are in trouble. Yeah, and um, uh, parents is, uh, is 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 probably the you know the original position statement had similar recommendations about involving coaches, involving officials, involving players. Um, but uh, I, I don't think it emphasizes as much uh, of the role that, that parents also were uh, critical stakeholders in this in this process and developing that environment. And and Merrill's right about you know that 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 balance of you know understanding um uh, the risk but also being sure to um you know still do our due diligence and that's what this position statement can do so the you know the first grouping of uh, recommendations uh, one through five i think are education and administration and those recommendations are you know they, they mirror a lot of the original recommendations in 2004 around you know getting stakeholders involved Increasing awareness, increasing education, um, but it's you know again, it's just uh, over time understanding the, uh, the the continued importance and significance, not just for spine injury but for head injury as well. So, from what I'm hearing um, with what Meryl said and Eric, what you just said is one of the I think the key things is just education uh, for parents, education for those individuals from if we think like social, a social ecological model from like the policy level all the way down to the individual level. Each uh, people in that, in, uh, each individual uh, level is gonna be important uh, to uh, move position statements like this forward. Um, but in order for us to get buy-in for the pertinent people at these levels, we have to provide appropriate education as well. It's one of the things that I'm picking up. Now, Eric, you, you started uh, discussing um, some of the recommendations. Um, so specifically the education and administration ed uh, recommendation. Um, so there are a couple different categories, uh, education administration, skill development, behavior modification, rules and regulation, technology and scientific research related to uh, decreasing head impact in football. Can you discuss the process for this particular statement, uh, position statement on how you identify these different categories and maybe a little bit as to why each of these are important pieces to be part of the, the process. Sure. Um, well, again, you know, using the using the 2004 position statement as as a critical starting point, obvious starting point. Um, there are similarities in the categories of the recommendations. Um, so staying true to those, and because they're still relevant today, um, as they uh, in in 2004, um, that. You, you will find the similarities with that position statement there. The, the other categories um, through our literature search, um, this was, you know, this, this had a systematic uh, literature review approach to it. Um, not all the recommendations are necessarily conducive to uh, scientific evidence uh, to, to generate them. Um, so you'll see, you know, some of the categories of the, the sort recommendations uh, the levels of, of evidence for them are, are a C category, um, which is which is fine. Uh, 
there's necessarily scientific evidence or, or higher level evidence to support those, but they're still relevant and, and critical um, for adoption to try and um, improve uh, you know, the behavior and the, and the modifications for decreasing head first contact. Um, when I think about the different categories and, and you know, all the recommendations, of course, we felt were important. So they're all equally important. Um, I think maybe you know, one of the ones in there is in the skill development and behavior modification category, and it's introducing evidence-based progressive techniques for avoiding head-first contact behavior during ball carrying, tackling, and blocking before the first exposure to tackle football. So again, this has some similarities to 2004. It's not just about tackling. It's going into contact. And it's so important that with our youth, when they're going you know, into tackle football for the first time, that there is um, evidence-based progressive techniques that are utilized to ensure that they're using the right technique and that they're developing that technique as their experience level and, and, and exposure, literal exposure to, to tackle football uh, increases. Um, so that is, that is probably a key uh, recommendation there Again, it's uh, similar to one of the 2004 recommendations. Um, and, and Merrill's, you know, I'm, I know Merrill has, has adopted a lot of this himself uh, in, in his coaching approaches, uh, but we're seeing a, a lot of this being picked up in, um, in, in other organizations, youth football organizations, uh, leagues around the country, and, and really understanding the importance around um, evidence-based progressive technique, you know, skill maintenance, um, throughout a, a player's journey in, in tackle football. So Eric, you mentioned um, of the uh, couple of times I've heard evidence-based recommendations and evidence-based um, uh, needing, uh, needing to use evidence-based practices in order for us to, to um, implement some of these strategies. Now, I, I, I guess my question to you is, from a research perspective, where do we go now? Where, where do we go next uh, in order for us to continue to advance the, the evidence in this area? Yeah, the, the last recommendation um, is, is, is sort of speaks to that. So uh, engage all stakeholders in the generation of high level scientific research to test and validate strategies, techniques, or technologies. So there's there's, Certainly, there's some things that um, are not as conducive to studying and generating scientific research. Some of these things are just common sense, logical recommendations. But there are strategies that may seem intuitive, but it's really important to validate that those strategies work. There's techniques, again, that may seem intuitive, but it's really important to validate that, that those techniques work. And even, and even technologies um, that may be maybe proposed to support the reduction of head impact exposure, but it's really important that we don't, we don't give up in the pursuit of trying to generate as, as high a level of evidence as we can, depending on, you know, on what that, uh, what, what that realm that might fall in, whether it's a technique, a strategy, even a rule or, or a change to the, you know, change to the game, changing rules in the game or um, officiating uh, changes, Penalties, um, following those through and monitoring that those those strategies are actually um, having an impact, a positive impact, the intended impact that that was desired. So uh, you you start um, listing and mentioning some of the recommendations um, from the different categories. Um, Eric, if you were to provide a take home point for athletic trainers based off of these recommendations. Um, an athletic trainer picks up the position statement and they read it. What, what's the, the big take-home message that you want them to get from this position statement? I know there are a lot of important messages. In yeah. There. Well, maybe the, maybe the first one, and you mentioned it when we started talking, it's, this all doesn't fall on the athletic trainer. So that's, and I think that that's, comes through loud and clear. Um, and, and again, going back to the 2004 position statement, because it was such a good model for it, um, you know, reinforcing that uh, all the stakeholders that, that have a responsibility, frankly, with this, um, athletic trainers are not alone. Um, but also, 
um, you know, be, ha having, having a level of scrutiny around um, techniques, uh, strategies, uh, technologies, equipment, um, having, having a level of scrutiny and, and it's okay to, to you know, seek um, and, and explore to the extent that there is um, evidence that, that, this, that supports any of those or even the lack of evidence when it comes to the behavior, the head first contact behavior. And that's what this position statement is, is really about. And it's, and it's sometimes a little bit hard to, you know, to grasp because it's, you know, it's a skill, it's a, it's a, it's a motor learning technique of when somebody's going into, into contact. So it's not, you know, it's not an easy thing to, to teach or maintain over time, um, but it's critically important. Um, so, so, you know, persistence and remaining vigilant is for all stakeholders to, to continue to strive for um, high level evidence. Well, thank you for that, that take home point. Now, Meryl, I'll, I'll uh, uh, give you the opportunity to provide your own take home point, uh, but potentially from the perspective of an athlete, from perspective of a parent, of a parent or a coach, um, what would you want the take home point for these individuals to, to know from uh, reading this uh, position statement? Um, well, Shelby, I, you know, when we were talking about stakeholders, there's, you know, there's a, a multi level. Um, uh, scope of that, you know, people in these two categories, if you love sports or need sports, you know, I think about all these universities where sports drives revenue and they drive um, not only revenue, but um, when you win a national title or you're successful in sports, your student body increases. I mean, there's a lot of value um, just in when I think of college and when you think of high school, you think of um the industries that are that are involved, not just parents and the people, but we've talked a lot about education, and I that is just part of it. Being educated is a critical component, but without application, we fail, um, and that requires application or an action. If we don't do both of those, you can be as smart and you can have all the rules and you can have all the proper processes and protocols. If you do not execute them, we fail. And knowing that, and I think when you when people leave that, and understanding that, you know, it is a a it's it, it's a team game. Okay, it's not on on the athletic trainers. It's the more we are all educated, the better off we're all going to be. And we have to think in those terms because evidence proves that. Um, what has been unfortunate narrative has been created if you have concussions, doom and gloom, and there's no scientific evidence to support that. And most people don't even go read the scientific literature to verify that. And that's why I always ask them, how do you know that? And where did you get that information? If you can't refer to a scientific paper or two or three to support what you're talking about, then I know that you're uneducated and uninformed about it because you're not going to find it if you Google it. You're going to have to find that in scientific journals. So uh, being educated is a, a vital component. Applying it is critical. And if we understood based on where we are today, based on the history of sports. When I think about when my career ended, and I think about just say, well, I'll just give it 10, 15 years ago, we had basically very few protocols that were in place at any sport. Only football had started that in 1991 with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Like I told you in 2003 is the first time it ever been implemented in a youth environment as far as sports. Heads up football wasn't launched until I think, I believe 2011. Okay, so there's a, you, you go back 15 years ago, you probably, if you played sports of any sort, you had no protocol. Equipment was paper mache to what we have today. When you think of instruction and guidance, poor if any. And then when you think of just the helmet alone with, you know, when you think of sports with helmets, okay, the helmet is 100% better today than it was just 10 years ago. So think about what it was for the first 70, 80, 90 years of sports. It is the best environment in the history of our country to be playing sports, every type of sport. And we're in fear because we're uneducated about this particular injury. People have been, I tell people it's easier to be fooled. It's easier to fool people than convince them they've been fooled. A lot of people have been fooled by the, the wrong information. They don't even know where they get their information. They've heard it on the evening news, which is a dangerous place to get your information. You know, I, I challenge people, 
use your common sense. Go ahead and be skeptical. Be skeptical of what we're sharing here, but then do your research to support it. You know, we're not telling you anything we can't prove. Uh, we're not trying to scare you. We're trying to empower you with what the real facts are. And if you leave with that and you do your education, your information, you look at the grand scope of things and what can be applied, you should be excited, you know, that you get to play sports. If I could do a do-over, which I don't live my life like that, but if I could go back and say, when would I want, I would want to be playing sports now. This is the best environment from nutrition, understanding the care of the body, protocols that are in place, equipment, instruction. It's the best environment ever. And we're declining in all kinds of sports. People are, our kids are dropping out because of fear of, uh, of this. I, I know there's other things other than that, but this one drives a lot of people. I just know from a youth perspective, it is a big drive. Um, and then when you start asking people, well, how do you know that? Where'd you get it? You get, you get a, you get a pause and I'm like, well, they don't even know where they're getting it from. They just heard it, you know, somewhere they didn't even verify it and they're letting that drive them. So um, hopefully what this does is not only educate and empower you, but we apply it and people start to see it and the results of it. Um, and, and that, and that's what will change things and evolve things, you know, and make things a better, a better perspective of what sports does give us and the value in it and the importance of it. Well, Eric and Meryl, thank you both for those awesome take-home points. Uh, do either of you have anything else that you want to make sure that our, our listeners know as it relates to the position statement? Um, no, I, I mean, I, I think we, I think we covered it. We covered um, you know, the, the really important uh, aspects of it. Um, yeah, I'm good. I'm think, good, Shelby. Think, yeah, I think we've. I think we've covered those and, and, and hope that people take the time to not just read the recommendations, but also also read the, the background um, and, and literature review uh, section as well. Um, you know, re read the entire document and then, and then uh, bring it with your local team, whoever that includes. Um, and, and please reach out with any questions. Perfect. Well, thank you both so much for joining me today. The position statement is available free of charge by the Journal of Athletic Training uh, in this upcoming issue. So I highly recommend everyone go and download the manuscript as soon as it comes out. Again, thank you both so much, and we will see you next time. Thank you, Shelby. Thanks, Shelby.